All right. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah. Good to see you guys. All right. We're going to wait a few minutes. Yeah, it does that, man. I'm trying to listen. Hold on. Let me just let people know. Good to see you. I'm doing it now because Anthony Rogers is about to debate around 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, right? Hold on, guys. Just wait. Let me just let people know. Hold on, brothers. Just wait for me. Anthony Rogers is going to have a debate on Acts 17 Apologetics Channel, Lord Jesus willing, in about two hours. So I wanted to go now so that, you know, I can get the teaching in and then we can watch the debate. Let me just set everything up. All right, and then, uh, okay, wait up. All righty, folks, we're going to finish some issues by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just wait for me. Hold on. All right, let me just send this to the page. All righty, then. All righty, then. We're ready. Okay. Okay, folks, good to see you. I'm a little early today because, like I was trying to say, it's now 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In two hours, the Lord Jesus willing, our precious brother, Anthony Rogers, one of our best apologists, is going to be debating a Unitarian heretic on the deity of Jesus Christ in the Pauline or Pauline epistles. Does Paul teach the deity of Jesus Christ? It's going to be on Acts 17 channel, Acts 17 apologetics. So as soon as we finish, what I want you guys to do is head over to Acts 17 apologetics. And what I want you to do is listen in because I'm going to try to listen in. So I wanted to come early and get another session in because what I'm trying to do is teach every night until I leave for LA next Wednesday. So Lord Jesus willing, Lord Jesus permitting, I'm going to be doing a live stream every night till Tuesday. And Tuesday I have a debate with a Muslim, some neophyte who shouldn't even be debating, but he challenged me and I accepted a challenge to call out his bluff. Pablo, what's your question? Let's take a question or two to prepare. I don't think we're going to have as many people, but pray we can build up my YouTube channel for the glory of Jesus Christ, get more subscribers, hit the like button, and more people listening. Because I really want to give the best information possible by the power of the Holy Spirit with wisdom for the Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit, not for. My, the Holy Spirit sanctify my mouth, anoint my mouth to speak without error, speak truthfully by his power and give me the power to live for the glory of Jesus, covered by the blood of Jesus, washed in the blood of Jesus, purified in the blood of Jesus, the Father's beloved Son in Jesus' name. And we're going to pray in a minute, but... May he loosen my tongue and may the Holy Spirit fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with life, the breath of life, and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to you. Please, Holy Spirit, we love you, we worship you, we are in love with you. In Jesus' name, Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Will it be on Tuesday, be streamed live? Yes, it's going to be. Yes. No, 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 I'm sorry, it won't be. It, my debate will be recorded, but it will then be posted that same day. I love you too. What's the question, Pablo? Glory to be God in high sir. By the way, for those of you who've been listening to the last two sessions, I hope I didn't offend any of you. I'm trying not to be offensive. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm asking Jesus by his grace to prevent me from being unnecessarily offensive. But at the same time, I don't want to tickle anyone's ears. Right? I want to be as honest as scripture as possible. Right? And by the way, this shaggy beard, I'm going to trim it next week. It makes me look older than I am. I love you, John. I love you all for the sake of Jesus. Be patient with me. I'm a work in progress. I will offend you. God bless you. I don't know if you're a sister or a brother, but Yes. Yep, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Exactly. That's what America Chaldean. 
It was answered yesterday, Jennifer. Did you listen? Jennifer, Salim, where were you? I answered your question yesterday. We did a two-hour session. It's answered. Oh, you did? Because you said, I pray my question's answered. I've been asking since yesterday. So you didn't get an answer? Barak, I don't keep tallies of people converting. Well, Jennifer, then I can't help you. If my answer wasn't clear, then you're going to have to be in the dark about it. Go back and listen to it again because I did answer your specific question about asking Mary to pray for us. I'm under heavy satanic attack, John 3.17. But I, I don't keep honestly tallies because one thing, I'm asking God to safeguard my heart. We don't want to make it a numbers game where we do it for conversions. And I got 20 people saved because salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. But with that said, I can tell you many people have left Islam and are following Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to go on around boasting because some people make it part of their ministry in order to get people to support them financially by playing the numbers game. Hey, if you support my ministry, we got 50 Muslims saved. I don't want to do that. May God purify my motives and my heart. I don't want to do that. Pray we at least get at least 100. I'm trying to work up to 1,000. Man, David Wood, he gets 1,000. I'm starting to hate. Why can't I get 1,000? Well, because I'm not on as on as often. So pray I can do that. You have my prayers for you. Yeah, thank you, John McDermott. I have a big trial in 60 days. Unless God miraculously intervenes, this wicked judge is ordering me to pay 40000 which I'm not. That's robbery. That's satanic to give corrupt lawyers 40000 that I didn't accrue. But Jesus is God. He covers us by his blood, and he fights for us. May God forgive me, have mercy on me, and strengthen me to be holy unto the Lord Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to talk about 1 Timothy 2.5. I'm going to unpack 1 Timothy 2.5. I did address that two days ago, right? No, it's the same, Judge, but it's okay. But I'm going to unpack 1 Timothy 2.5. That's why I wanted to do a fourth session on intercession of the saints. And again, by the way, I do want to take a moment to say this. All of you subscribers who are supporters on my Patreon page who've been supporting me, you know who you are. There are many of you. One thing I want to say, forgive me that I haven't contacted you personally and thank you from my heart for supporting me. Because you know, David Wood, myself and others, when full-time ministry and as servants of the Lord Jesus, we depend on the grace of God to provide for our needs. And God provides through you. So I want to say a personal thank you for all the brothers and sisters who are praying for me, fasting for me, and supporting me financially via Patreon. You know who you are. God bless you. Right? And I mean it from my heart. May the Lord Jesus bless you. But one thing I do ask, and one thing I want you to pray, that I never compromise, corrupt myself for money. Because there are people who will tell you what you want to hear so that they can continue getting support from their base. Pray I never prostitute myself for money, that I maintain integrity for the glory of Jesus, and at the same time be as unnecessarily offensive as possible. But I don't ever want to prostitute myself for money. God forbid. May God save me from that. So thank you again. You brothers and sisters who've been praying for me, fasting for me, and you supporters who've been supporting me faithfully via Patreon, the Lord Jesus richly bless you and shine his face on you and preserve you for standing with me. You don't have to, and I appreciate it. I really do. You know who you are. There are many of you. Please don't be offended if I don't reach out to you. I'm going through a lot right now, and I'm waiting to get out of this prison and this desert to be free to start a new chapter in my life for the glory of Jesus. Thank you, King of Kings. Uh, that You almost made me cry right there. <clears throat> Sam, you were born to teach others. King of Kings, you don't know how many times I asked God to speak to me and confirm to me through the mouths of his children whether he's anointed me to teach and whether he has set me apart to do this full time or should I stop. So what you just said here moved me in my heart. Thank you, King of Kings. I really, I really mean that from my heart. I don't use Super Chat because I was told, John 317, I was told by David Wood, they take 50% of your donations. Did you know that? <laughs> I need that 50%. David Wood needs that. We all need it, man. This is what we do for a living for the glory of Christ. Idiot, I love this brother. This brother is going to be hosting me for two weeks. Boy, is he going to be in misery. He's going to get a taste of purgatory. 
Yeah, they do. That's what uh, David Wood told me. He told me about 50%, I guess. I don't know. I think he meant 30%, whatever. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. I have no idea what you're talking about there. It's an issue of church discipline that God will remove his hand of protection so that Satan can make this person's life a living hell to bring him back to repentance. So I don't know what you're trying to prove by this passage, but let's not go there right now. Yeah, he said 30%, but somehow it comes up to 50%. I don't know. It's because maybe saying the taxes you have to pay. All right. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. The reason why I started early, folks, let me remind you. 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, our brother Anthony Rogers is going to be debating on Acts 17 Apologetics. David Woods. Hold on. Sorry about that. David Woods YouTube channel. He's going to be debating a Unitarian, her Unitarian heretic on Paul's witness to the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It says straight out of Modesto. I got this. Shirt from Modesto, straight out of Modesto. I'm not trying to hear that. See, pray. I'm getting my muscles back in Jesus. I get my trim, my muscles back, my health back. Just by way of testimony, let me just share something. Before I came into the faith, I used to be a bodybuilder and a kickboxer. Seriously. I was about 220 pounds of muscle. I had a flat stomach. And I was shredded. I wasn't, I didn't have a six pack yet. And I never did steroids. And everyone thought I used to do steroids, right? I was really massive and muscular, right? And I used to be a you know, kickboxer, honestly. And I actually thought in my arrogance I was going to be the first Assyrian kickboxing champion and use that to enter into films and become the first Assyrian superstar. That's how delusional I was. <laughs> you know, I was very delusional, right? That's how delusional I was. The Lord then convicted me, transformed me, and then thrusted me into apologetics. That's why you see I have such great love for Bruce Lee. Right? That's why you see Bruce Lee was one of the biggest influences in my life. And to this day, I know he's human and he was a little guy. And like all fighters, he could be beat. But it's hard for me to believe that there was anyone who could beat him in a physical fight. Honestly. I was so in awe of him. Right? I made him more than he is, and may God guard my heart, right? So Bruce Lee was it for me. So I wanted to be the Assyrian Lee, or more, more accurately, Jiro Lee. You have offended my family, and you have offended the Assyrian temple. Wah! Kick me. Kick me. What was that? An exhibition? Real emotional content. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Never concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Do you understand? Never take your eyes off your opponent, even when you bow. That's the song for Enter the Dragon. Right? Anyway. Wake up, she's gone. Guys, come on. With a personality like this, what woman wouldn't? fall in love with me and adore me and want to spend the race, rest of her life with me. No woman. That's why I'm all alone. <laughs> now that you're gone, I'll be crying, crying, crying over you, crying over you. You know, it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be the Holy Spirit. To fill me with such joy and peace in light of the trial I'm about to face, right? You know this is Jesus, the Almighty Son of God. Crying over you, crying. I taught you had a girlfriend, so you want to teach me how to have a girlfriend? No, I don't. Now that you're gone. Anyway, with that said, I want to just talk about 1 Timothy 2, go a little more in depth. And then Pablo had a question. There is a movement, and I'm going to begin in prayer. There is a movement out there. They are a, a form, a branch of dispensationalists. God willing, Barak, if everything opens up and no more satanic intervention, I'll be there in October. Lord willing, I'm planning to live there, relocate in October. And please do hit the like button. 
right? There is a branch of dispensationalism that teaches the following. Listen, because I'm going to address it tonight, Lord willing. And I want to go in depth on 1 Timothy 2.5, okay? This branch of dispensationalism teaches that Jesus' Jewish apostles, Peter, James, and John, when they preached to the Jews, they preached basically a different message of salvation. Are you guys ready to hear this? They taught the Jews that they needed to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. And they will quote Acts 2.38. But in the midpoint of Acts, some will say when they rejected Stephen's testimony and killed him, then the Lord Jesus raised up Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles, and then the message of salvation was different. The message then became, you're saved by grace through faith in the blood of, in the blood of Jesus. And that was a revelation given only to Paul. You with me there? How many of you have heard that teaching? How many of you have heard that teaching? Pablo, are you here? Because this is a question you had asked me. Or did Pablo make it back? Okay. I'm going to refute that assertion. I'm going to tell you that's not biblical. That's manhandling, mishandling, mishandling, falsely interpreting scripture. But let's get into prayer and ask the false spirit to glorify me. Father, please sanctify us and sanctify me. Anoint me. Anoint my mouth, the words of my mouth, by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak truth without error. And to speak it for the glory of Jesus. And Father, please fill all of us with your presence, with the presence of Jesus. And cover us with the blood of Jesus. And fill us with the Holy Spirit. Give us unction from the Spirit, knowledge from the Spirit, wisdom from the Spirit, and the power of your Holy Spirit to know your word and to live it and love it and proclaim it for the glory of Jesus. And cover us with the blood of Jesus and our loved ones. Cover our family members, my daughters, with the blood of Jesus. And save us from attacks of the enemy, Father. And please make the sound of my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants for your glory. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yehovah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. By the way, as I was telling my testimony, I wanted to be a kickboxer who ended up in the movies, right? So become the first Assyrian superstar. All right, sorry. Okay, is it working now? Yeah, I know, I know. That's why I waited. I saw. It's lagging. I pray by the grace of God that the internet connectivity stays strong because we're about to begin. Anyway, first last is a hater because he thinks he's a Wing Chun dude. I was actually an amazing kickboxer. I used to go to all the local stores and kick boxes all day, and I kicked more boxes than any other kickboxer. Did you know that? Grandmaster kickboxing. Okay. And by the way, you know, you've heard of the system Taekwondo, right? You guys have heard of Taekwondo? Let me get the article ready. Hold on. Did you know I'm the grandmaster of Take One To Go? I'm the grandmaster of Take One To Go. And I got a ninth degree black, black belt in Take Your Dough. Grandmaster in Take One To Go and a ninth degree black belt in Take Your Dough. What All right. Let's begin for the glory of Jesus. We're going to unpack... Timothy. <laughs> Man, I got issues. Come on, ladies. I'm a big bum, and I'm just full of joy and laughter. Come on now. Don't hate. I'm not going to be here for too long. No, just kidding, guys. All right, let's see. This is the article I'm going to be using. So our brother, praise the Lord for our brother Orbiter for serving us. He won't have to be quoting too much verses today. So here, I want you to All right, it's buffering again. I don't know what's going on. Is it okay? Is the sound good now? Is the quality of the screen good? All right. Okay, here's that article. Yeah, I know. It's not, it's not, I got no control. Okay, I'm going to again unpack 1 Timothy 2 5 because this is the main passage everybody uses to argue against the communion of saints. I already addressed it in the first session. If you go back, Three nights ago, I addressed 1 Timothy 2.5 and its misuse by us Protestants to try to refute the veneration of saints, the communion of saints. I'm going to go a little more deeper today, but let's read it. 1 Timothy 2.5. But you're going to have to, after we read it, you're going to have to click on the article because I'm just going to read the verses that are in the article. Okay, now, 1 Timothy 2.5. Here's what it says. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. This passage is used 
by us Protestants, right? Because I am a Protestant evangelical. To show that because our Lord Jesus Christ is the one mediator, you can't have... God, I'm sure what's going on. All right, it's buffering again. Hey, is that normal? What's happening right now? That's buffering? Is it okay? What does that mean? Okay. Anyway, uh, when I see it buffering, I stop. Okay, well, plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, please keep Satan away. Anyway, this passage, pay attention, folks, and follow with me. This passage is used to show that since Christ is the one mediator, you can't have anyone else mediating or praying for you as a means of attacking the belief that you can ask saints who are glorified in the presence of Jesus to pray for you, especially the Blessed Mother of our Lord, right? You with me there? This is the passage everyone uses, and I used to use it in that sense as well. You with me there? Now, the session I did three nights ago, I demonstrated why, why this passage doesn't prove that point. But let me unpack it further. Let's look at the passage one more time. And then we're going to talk about whether the apostles of our Lord Jesus before the conversion of Paul preached a different message of salvation to the Jews. Okay, now with me. Let's look at 1 Timothy 2.5 clearly one more time. Let's look at it one more time. You ready? 1 Timothy 2.5. And Arbiter is going to post it again. All right, hold on. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Pay attention. It doesn't just say there's one mediator. It says there's one God. Folks, please, I need your undivided attention by the power of the Holy Spirit so you can learn how to interpret Scripture for the glory of Christ. If Jesus being the one mediator means there are no other mediators, this ends up proving too much because... Should I just continue or should I stop? Hold on. Oh, my. Should I keep going or should I just stop? Trusting that by the grace of God, I'll be okay. Should I just discontinue the session? I don't know why it's giving me problems today. Should I continue? Okay. Okay. Now, again, because we please, Lord Jesus, your will be done. Bless this session. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, let's let's let me unpack it. First Timothy 2 5 says, pay attention. For there is one God, one God, and one mediator between no other mediators exist or function. Okay. If, if Jesus being the one mediator proves, hold on, proves that no other mediators exist or function, right? Listen to me. I don't know what you mean saying do 360. No, I know. I just, I try to shut it down. Okay, anyway. Should be okay now. I don't know how to, yeah, where's the resolution? Where would I do that? You're talking to a guy who's tech, technologically illiterate. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. So when you say turn down the resolution, where? Okay, anyway, let's focus. Guys, let's focus, okay? The corner of the screen. Okay. Wheel looking okay. I'm here. It says auto 144p settings. Okay, so what am I supposed to do? It's a 720. So what should I go down to? 360? Okay. All right, I did 360. Okay, I put it on 360. Yep, it's 360. Actually, it looked better now. Hmm, interesting. Okay, is it good now? Okay, beautiful. Thank, thank you guys, man. Now I learn. Glory to Jesus. All right, now let's focus. Let's focus. I wasn't on 144. I was actually on 720. Okay, let's focus. I was on 720. All right, guys, now let's focus because we got to focus because our time is running out. Yep. Let's focus again. First Timothy 2.5. Let's look at it again. 
For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now pay attention. If the one mediator, Jesus, implies no other mediators exist or function, then notice Jesus is the one mediator before the one God. So do you see here that the one God is someone other than Jesus? Right? Notice that the one God here is not Jesus, but is the one that Jesus mediates before, correct? So if you're going to use 1 Timothy 2, 5 to prove that since Jesus is the one mediator, no other mediators exist, then now you ended up proving Jesus can't be God because he is distinct from the one God. He mediates before the one God, which is exactly how anti-Trinitarians like Joe's witnesses use the verse. So now notice we Trinitarians use this passage inconsistently in that we want to use it to prove one mediator, no other mediators when dealing with Roman Catholics, Orthodox. But when Joe's witnesses, anti-Trinitarians use this passage to prove Jesus can't be God because the one God is distinct from him, we say not so fast. Right? What's my point? One mediator no more proves there aren't others who mediate in union with Christ than the one God proves that Jesus isn't God because he's distinct from the one God before whom he mediates. Just like you would say, yes, the one God there would be the Father, but the one God, not to the exclusion of the Son, he's the one God in union with the Son and the Spirit, because altogether they are one God, because we let the Bible as a whole inform our theology. You with me there? We let the Bible as a whole inform our theology. So if the Bible as a whole says Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and they're one with the Father in essence, distinct from him in person, not three gods, then that means 1 Timothy 2.5 cannot contradict what Paul has written elsewhere or what the, whole, the Bible as a whole teaches. In fact, I guarantee you, listen to me, when you go listen to the debate with Anthony Rogers, I guarantee you the Unitarian heretic is going to use 1 Timothy 2.5 to prove that Jesus isn't God. How many, bet, how many people want to bet me? He's going to bring that up because the debate is Paul's Christology. Did Paul teach Jesus God? How many of you want to bet me that he's going to quote 1 Timothy 2.5 and 1 Corinthians 8.6 to prove because Jesus is distinguished from the one God identified as the Father, he can't be God? Anyone want to bet me? You get my point? But we would say you're wrong to interpret these passages this way because though the Father is the one God, he's not the one God to the exclusion of the Son and the Spirit. He's the one God in union with his Son and Spirit because all together, all three are the one God. So one here cannot mean solitary, alone, excluding everyone. If the one God in 1 Timothy 2, 5 doesn't mean solitary alone, excluding everyone, neither does Jesus being the one mediator prove that there aren't others who participate in Christ's mediation, who share in Christ's mediation because they make up the spiritual body of Christ. They're one with Christ in the spirit and Christ shares his mediation with them and through them. You with me there? Do you understand what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate? Okay. All righty then. Okay. Still buffering. Not as bad. But did you understand the point there? When it says one God, that doesn't mean Jesus isn't God or the Spirit isn't God. Therefore, when it says one mediator, it doesn't mean that Jesus alone mediates and doesn't share his work of mediation with the members of the body of Jesus Christ. Is that clear? Before I now go into the evidence to prove what I'm about to show. You guys getting it? Now, let me prove to you from the context itself that in 1 Timothy 2, 5, Paul's point isn't because Jesus is one mediator, no one can mediate. Paul is teaching the opposite point. He's saying 
Because we have one mediator before God, the man Christ Jesus who identifies with us and that he shares our humanity, he now mediates our prayers intercessions before God so that now when... Do you want me to prove to you that's Paul's point? Do you want me to prove to you that's Paul's point? Jesus is the sole mediator and there's no one participates in his mediation it's the opposite point what paul is trying to show is because we have a mediator before god who makes our requests acceptable to god all the more reason to pray intercede because we know that mediator will mediate our prayers to god and make them acceptable to god clear Is that clear? Now let me prove you that to you. Let's read now 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 6. Now let's see what Paul's son is in conflict. Okay. As the Lord Jesus blesses us. Okay. All right. I don't know what to tell you guys. I know. Should I continue? Because it seems like it's buffering too much, more than usual. I don't get it. Huh? I don't know what you mean, full connection the bottom of the screen. What bottom of what screen? Okay. I've turned everything so off, so let's see. All right, okay. Just pray because I'm getting tired of, you know, the buffering. Hold on. Bottom right-hand corner. I don't know what you mean, bottom right-hand corner. Uh, my name's not Sham, so if you're insulting me by calling me a Sham, you know you're going to get blocked. Okay. But you understand the point before I move on, right? That in context, Paul is not saying Jesus, right? Paul is not saying, hold on, what happened here? Where is that resolution thing you're saying? Hold on. No, I'm on 360. Should I go lower? Okay, I went to 240. Okay. I went to 240, all right. I hate when stuff like this happens all the time. Uh, no, uh, the my bar is up first and last. That's why you confuse me. It's not the bottom right. It's at the top right, and it's full, the connectivity bar. So that's where you confuse me because you don't have a max sellout. Okay. Get with the Mac. Okay. I did 240. Anyway, are you guys with me here? Are we following along? 1 Timothy 2.5, in context, Paul is teaching the opposite point. He's not saying because Jesus is the only mediator, no one mediates. He's teaching the opposite point. The point he's teaching, here we go again. One more time, I'm going to shut down, bro. One more time, I'm shutting down. I can't handle this. Yeah, it's not meant to be. Unbelievable, man. This happens again, man. I'm going to bust the Mac and I'm going to stop because it keeps buffering. Anne-Marie, why are you asking me questions not related to the topic? You know, I'm having a field day. I'm blocking everyone. All right. 1 Timothy 2.5, again, in Jesus' name, please, Lord, please, if you want me to teach, then help us. 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul is not teaching because Jesus is the one mediator. No one else can mediate. He's teaching the opposite point. And the point that he's teaching is that because Jesus is, make, make them acceptable.
Yeah, I'm, I'm losing patience here. Well, it's not that it's bothering me. The problem is it's going to bother you. Every time I say something, it cuts off. So if it's going to keep cutting off, then you can't follow the argument, can you? So now you're saying get closer to the router. All right. Let's get closer to the router. Let's see what happens. Man, you know, I am one gorgeous human being. You got to admit. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Come on, man. Look at me. Come on now. I'm getting my health back. Don't hate. All right. I'm now closer to the router. You're saying getting closer to the router will work? Okay. Look at me. Come on now. Don't hate. Don't hate. All right. So you're saying getting closer to the router will work? Pray, man. I got to get my health back. 50 more to go by the grace of Jesus. No, it wasn't through necromancy. God summoned the spirit of Samuel, not through the agency of the witch, but in spite of the witch, witch of Endor. I'll talk about that in a future session. Now I'm closer to the router. You're saying if I'm closer to the router, it should be better? No, that Maroslav, it wasn't an abomination because Samuel confirmed the prophetic message that he gave to Saul while he was on earth. And everything he said came to pass because the next day Saul and his sons were killed. Okay, let's let's continue. Let me now make the point that I've been trying for the last 10 minutes, and I pray people come back to watch it won't get disturbed by the grace of Jesus. Anyway, 1 Timothy 2.5 is teaching, because Christ is the one mediator, he mediates our prayers and petitions to God, making our intercessions for people acceptable. In other words, he's not teaching because Christ is the one mediator, no other mediators. That's the opposite point. Listen to my argument. In the context, Jesus is teaching through Paul, that because I'm your one mediator and I'm one of you because I'm human like you and I offered myself as a ransom for the salvation of mankind, you now have the confidence to go before God knowing your prayers will be accepted to, acceptable to God. Your intercessions will be acceptable to God because I mediate your prayers to God and make them acceptable. He's teaching the opposite point. You with me there? Let me prove it to you. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 6. And then I'm going to show you how the Bible uses the language one. The Greek word, the Rasmian pronunciation for the Greek is heis, or is, or manas. I'm going to show you that that very language of one is used in other places without excluding other individuals from assuming the very role or function that the Bible says belongs to one particular individual. And I'll explain what I mean in a minute, but read with me. Now read with me. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 6. Let's see the point that Paul was making. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, this is how the context begins, supplicate, prayers, intercessions, intercede, right? And giving of things be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is, here's the reason, see? For there is one God. There's only one God for all men. So the only God that all men must turn to to be saved is that one God revealed in Jesus Christ, because there's no other God that can save. And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So do you understand the point of Paul here, guys? Did you catch it? Paul's point in context isn't that because Jesus is the one mediator, there is no other mediator. It's the opposite point. You with me there? Paul's point in context is because you have one mediator who's human like you, who shares in your humanity, identifies with you, who offered himself as a ransom to make you acceptable to God, now you have the confidence and boldness to know you can pray and proceed for others to be saved and you will be heard. Right? So how does this passage refute the communion of saints? And why would we use it in that manner? This is similar to what we read in Hebrews 4. 15 to 16. Let's go to Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. We're up to 100. Good. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. 
if you want more on that, go go back to the session I did three nights ago where I spoke on 1 Timothy 5. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because he became one of us. He identifies with us. He sympathizes with us. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now notice, because of that, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Paul is teaching the opposite, that because you have a high priest who's your mediator, who offered his life to ransom you and has now made you acceptable to God, you have confidence and boldness to approach God with your requests and God will hear you because of that one mediator. Right? Miroslav, you know I'm going to block you, right? You're, you're not going to stay in the room because I've already discussed the evidence in the last three nights. But Miroslav, you're gone. Enjoy the fact you won't come back. Hold on. Yep. Now, Ephesians 3.12. Abraham, it's not because your dream, dream proves I'm right. Don't ever base your faith on dreams because you can have a satanic deception, a satanic dream. I'm right because the Bible teaches it, right? Not because your dream confirmed it. Ephesians 3.12, in whom, in union with Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, we have boldness. You catch it? All righty then. Okay, let's do it again. Ephesians 3.12. In whom, in union with Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So do you understand what 1 Timothy 2.5 is not teaching? Do you understand what 1 Timothy 2.5 is not teaching? And do you understand what it's teaching now in context? You guys understand or no? Before I move on. Are you guys getting it or no? If someone's confused, put a two. If you're not confused, then you understand that 1 Timothy 2.5 cannot be used to refute veneration of saints, communion of saints, right? Because that's not the point that Paul is making in 1 Timothy 2.5, right? Paul is making an opposite point. Paul's point in 1 Timothy 2.5 is because we have one mediator who offered his life as a ransom, he makes our prayers, intercessions acceptable to God. In other words, Paul is using that to encourage you, do pray, intercede for others. He's not saying don't waste your time because you don't have anyone else but Jesus to intercede. Is that clear? If you're not confused, I want to now talk about the language of one. Because now I'm going to post the paper again. Here's the link to my article that you need to read. I wrote a two-part article refuting the misuse of 1 Timothy 2.5 by us Protestants, right? Okay. I'm going to show you that that word one in 1 Timothy 2.5, eis or heis, heis mesites, or heis theos, the word one, and the other word used for one in the Greek New Testament, manas or monos, these words are not used in such a way to exclude others. In other words, I'm going to show you places where God is said to be one of this, like one shepherd or, or the only good. And yet I'm going to show you that the same Bible says there are other shepherds, others who are good. Are you ready now to journey with me on how to interpret the Bible carefully, reverently, by the grace of God's Spirit, and how and how not to misinterpret it? I don't know what else to do. I feel like this is probably a waste, the, the buffering. Will it affect people going back and watching this? Yeah, I think so. What's P and auto? 
What's put P in auto? What does that mean? So you're saying, yes, it will. So I should just cancel and delete this? All right. Should I just close it and delete it? Okay. I'm, I don't want to give up. It's for you guys. I don't want to frustrate you. It's not I'm getting frustrated for me. It's for you guys. Because people are going to come here and they're going to get bored and cut it off. No, it's on. A, it's everyone's end. No, I did. I did less than three sixty. I don't know how many more. All right. Okay, let's go lower now. And now I went down to one forty four. Yeah, maybe it's YouTube then. Okay, if you don't mind. All right, I went down to one hundred forty four p now. Is this is the quality of the picture still good? I have no idea what you mean, put in auto. Guys, let me make it clear to you guys again. I am not technically savvy. I'm not good with the computer. So don't tell me something to do when I don't know how to do it. What do you mean, put in auto? Love you guys too. I'm getting frustrated for you guys. I don't want you to get frustrated with the buffering. Okay. Okay, now if we're ready, if we're ready, are you not ready to go to my article? Go to the article. Because we're going to just work through it, okay? That's probably on your end, and it's your computer, Eugenio. If everyone else, it's good for them, and it's your computer. Okay. I'm now going to show you where the word one is used in context does not rule out others. Okay, now you understand what I want to prove now. I'm trying to teach you how to interpret Scripture, how not to interpret Scripture. Okay, are you ready? Are you guys ready for it? Okay. Okay. If you're ready, I'm now going to show you where the Bible says that God is one of this or the only one of this or refers to someone else as being the one of this or the only one of this. And yet you'll find places where others are said to possess that quality or perform that function. For example, Jesus is the one shepherd, and yet the apostles are shepherds. Elders are shepherds. God alone is good, and yet Jesus is good, and those born of the Spirit are good. You understand what I'm going to now demonstrate? That the use of one, the use of only in the Bible doesn't always mean there aren't others who share that quality or perform that function. Let me repeat again. The Bible is written in such a way that when it uses the words one and only, it doesn't always mean that there, there aren't others who possess that quality or assume that role. So you have to be careful with how the Bible uses the words one or only. You with me there? Are you ready now? If you're ready, let me know. And by the way, do me a favor because I'm not going to be looking at the comment section. I'm going to be looking at my article. First and last, or orbiter, text me on my phone when it starts buffering. Let me get the phone. One second. Hold on. Let me entertain you. La, 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 la. I know we'll be off to somebody else. La, 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 la. I know you belong to somebody else. All right. Okay. Uh, what a guy. All righty then. Pray that specific one loves me. People don't know who I'm talking about. Some do. There's one in particular I have my eyes on. I believe God brought her my way. If she's the one, ask the Lord to put in her heart to love me for his sake. You know who you are. Yes, you do. Oh, yeah, you do. All right. Okay. You ready now? Again, I'm going to show you. I know people are going to say, man, this guy repeats himself too many times. I'd rather repeat myself so you can get it. I'm going to show you where the Bible uses the terms one and only in such a way that it doesn't exclude others from possessing that very quality or assuming that role or function so that the Bible doesn't use one and only in the sense of there is no one else. Only this one, no one else. It doesn't use one or only in that manner. No, it's not buffering, Eugenio. It's your computer. So don't make your computer problem my problem. I have enough problems to begin with. Is it buffering with you guys? 
Two people said it's buffering. Okay. Not let's begin. Ready? Okay. Yeah, that's Texas. All you exes are from Texas. All my exes are from Texas. Okay. Let's begin. Go to the article. Let's go to the article. According to the Bible, God alone is good. Right? And it uses <clears throat> Udeis, which means no one. Okay. Mark 10, 17, 18. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, Mark 10, 17, 18, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Udeis agathos, no one is good. And then it uses the word Heis, the same word in 1 Timothy 2, 5, where it says one mediator, Heis or Is, Masites, Heis, Ace, Theos. There is no one who is good but God alone, one God, Heis. Now, if we were to interpret this passage the way anti-Trinitarians interpret 1 Timothy 2, 5, or Protestants interpret 1 Timothy 2, 5 to rule out other mediators, then that means there is no one who is good except God alone. And in this context, it would refer to God the Father. Hold on, though. Luke 23, 50. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good, agathos, and righteous man. Wait, I thought, I thought only God is agathos. Only God is good. But here, Joseph of Arimathea is also good. Same word, agathos. Acts 11, 22 to 24. The news about them reached the ears of the church. Acts 11, 22 to 24. It's in my article on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to go to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord in firmness of heart. For he was a good man, filled with the Holy Spirit, and faith. All right. All right. Okay. For he was a good man. Did you guys catch it? Joseph of Arimathea and Barnabas were good men. Were good men. Did you catch it? But wait, it says only God is good. Heis Agathos, right? Hi, Steos. Right? So which is it? Is only God good or are there others who are good? You understand what I'm proving here? Just because God is the only one who's good, that doesn't mean there aren't others who are goodness, who are made good by the grace of God and share in God's goodness. Likewise, just because Christ is the one mediator doesn't mean there aren't other mediators who, because they're united to Christ, form his spiritual body, share in his mediation. Is that clear? Make sure you're following me. If I'm losing anyone, love life. If no one is as good as God, which in, in one sense you're right, then you're going to argue that Jesus isn't as good as God the Father. When we know that Jesus is absolutely, infinitely good and just as good as God the Father. So don't help me to make my point, love life, because you won't have a love life for long. <laughs> All right. You ready now? Okay. Let's move on to the next example. Next example. God alone is holy, set apart. Revelation 15, 4. Who will not fear you, Lord, or glorify your name? For you alone are holy. Now, it uses the word manas or monos. Hati monos hosios. You alone are holy. But hold on. Hebrews 7, 23, 26, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to skip to the last part. It was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, hosios, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens. Hold on. I thought only God the Father was good. But Jesus, who's not God the Father, is also holy. I thought only God the Father was holy. But Jesus, who's not God the Father, he's also holy, Hosios. Clear? Uh, first and last, what do you mean not for me? I don't get what you're saying. You confuse me here. 
So is God the only one who's holy? Uh, I'm Apollo. You're not following me. In that chapter, it's talking about God the Father. Who said that Jesus isn't God? Is God the only one who's holy so there's no one else? Or is it saying that God is essentially holy and yet others are also holy by his grace, by participation in his nature, by union with God? So he's not the only one who's holy to the exclusion of others. So this only or one language doesn't mean to exclude others. That's what I'm trying to establish. Hold on. That's what I'm trying to establish. I know it buffered for a minute. No, I wouldn't use collective good or collective only. Stop using that term, John McDermott. Not collective, right? I know that you're using it in the sense that I mean, but I still wouldn't use it. Is that clear? But love life, in Mark 10, 17, 18, Jesus would be referring to God the Father. So let's not try to make our case much more complicated than it is. Okay, if that's clear, let's move on to the other example. One Lord. How many lords are there? There's only one, and it's Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the latter part of the verse. And one Lord is Kyrios, or Heis Kurios, Jesus Christ. One Lord, and it's using that same word, Heis, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Ephesians 4, 5. One Lord, Hakurias. And that's Jesus Christ again. So now if I were to apply the interpretation employed by anti-Trinitarians to 1 Timothy 2, 5, or Protestants like myself, <clears throat> to Jesus being the one mediator to prove no other mediators exist, that means since Jesus is Heis Kurias, the one Lord, the Father can't be Lord, the Spirit can't be Lord, and there are no other lords according to the Bible. But contraire, James 3, 9. With it we bless the Lord and Father. Tan kurian kai patera. So the Father is Lord too. But wait, Jesus is said to be the one Lord. How can the Father be Lord? Revelation 4, 11, Again, speaking of God the Father. Worthy are you, Lord our God. Ha kurias kai theos heimon. So the Father is Lord. But wait, Jesus is said to be Heis Kurias, the one Lord. Can't be anyone else. Are you following the point? I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I want to make sure you're getting it. Are you, are you learning how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible? And are you learning how the Bible uses the language one, only, no one else? It doesn't always use it in an exclusive, restrictive sense so that there can't be others who either share in that quality, characteristic, or assume that function. Are you getting it? This is this is for your benefit. I'm trying to teach you and help you see by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to help you learn the Word of God and live it for the glory of Christ. Are you getting it? So far? Okay. Not only is the Father Lord Kurias, the Bible says there are human lords, masters on earth, using the word Kurias. Colossians 3, 22 to 41. Colossians 3, 22 to chapter 4, verse 1. Slaves, obey your human masters. Kata, sarka, kuriois. Masters of in the flesh. So here, human masters who own slaves are called lords. But wait, I thought there's only one lord. One kurios, obey them in everything, not only when being watched as curing favor, but in simplicity of heart, fearing the Lord, tan kurian, meaning Jesus. Whatever you do, do from the heart as for the Lord, to kiryu, and not for others, knowing that you receive from the Lord, apo, kiryu, the due payment of the inheritance. Be slaves of the Lord Christ, to kiryu, Christo. You catch it here? Folks, I'm confused. I'm confused. I thought there's only one Lord, Heis Kurias. Only one Lord, Jesus. How then is the Father Lord? And how can human masters be called lords if there's only one Lord? Okay, let's go to the other example. There's only one teacher, Matthew 23, 8. 
As for you, do not be called rabbi. You have but one teacher, didaskolos, and it's heis, is didaskolos. You call me teacher and Lord. Ho didaskolos kai ha kurias, or ho kurias, ha kurias. And rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, ha kurias, ho kurias, kai ha didaskolos. The one teacher is Jesus. But hold on. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31, the Lord Jesus has raised up many teachers for the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. Some people God has designed, designated, I'm sorry, some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Didas, didaskalaus. Teachers. But I thought there's only one teacher. Can you help me understand? How can Jesus be the one Lord? The one teacher? But there are many other lords, many other teachers? Is it making sense now? Yeah, Rocco, forgive me for butchering the pronunciation of the Greek because we're using the Erasmian pronunciation. Are you there? So here's my question for every one of you. All right. I know. Okay. Okay. So here's my question, every one of you. If Jesus is the one Lord, is curious or highs curious, the one teacher, is didaskalos, is didaskalos, how can there be other lords and teachers? Because, again, this proves that the Bible can use restrictive language, exclusive language, one and only, without implying there aren't others who share in that quality or assume that role. Is that clear? Am I making sense or am I putting you to sleep? I'm boring you guys. Because I have to be done in about 20 minutes. Is it clear? These examples show that you can say that God or Jesus or even someone else is one of this thing, the only one of this thing, without implying there aren't others as well. Okay. Now let's go to the next example. One shepherd. Okay. John 10, 16. I'll skip to John 10, 16. In John 10, 11 says, I'm the good shepherd. John 14, I'm the good shepherd. But let's go to 16. And there will be one flock, Mia, that's the fem feminine form of, of the word one. It's the feminine form of Heis. And one shepherd, Heis Poimen. Jesus, the good shepherd, is the one shepherd. Heis or Is Poimen. How many shepherds are there, folks? How many shepherds are there? John 10, 16. And John 10, 14 tells us that one shepherd is Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. So how many shepherds are there? Is Poiman, high Poiman, right? Lydia, if you show me two in that verse, I'll cut off my hand and become Muslim. Show me where it says two shepherds there. John 10, 16. I'll cut off my hand and become Muslim. Okay. How many shepherds are there? John 10, 16. It's okay, lady. You don't have to be my enemy, but you're still going to cause me to cut my hand off and become Muslim. You said two. One, right? Okay. So there's only one shepherd. That's Jesus, our Lord. Hold on. Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. Paul speaking to the elders, the bishops of the church. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds poimonian, of the church of God. You elders, you're shepherds, plural, of the church of God. Wait, Paul. Jesus said he's the one shepherd. Heis, poimon. How then can you say that elders are shepherds? You know why? Because the elders are the members of the body of Christ. 
born of the Spirit, united to Christ, and share in his role of shepherding. He is a shepherd that discharges his role through the agency of the overseers that he's raised to represent him as his shepherds on earth. So the word heis, poimen, doesn't mean no other shepherds exist. You with me there? Defending Christianity. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna bounce you and block you here because the word feed in the Greek is shepherd. But because you want to be a know-it-all and don't shut up and just listen and learn. See you later, friend, because you're not defending Christianity, you're defending your tradition. Repulsive, man. Yeah. Yeah, you're very honest. You're so honest that now you're going to be honest to yourself in your little world in a corner of your room. Okay, you with me there? Ephesians 4.11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers, poimenos, poimenos, and the daskalos. Notice, they are shepherds and teachers. But folks, Jesus says there's one teacher, the daskalos. There's one shepherd, poimen. Here, Paul says, Christ has raised up many shepherds and teachers for the body of Christ. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4. I'll skip to the relevant part. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Is it clear to everyone? The one shepherd Jesus doesn't exclude others from being shepherds. The one shepherd Jesus discharges his role as shepherd through the agency of the elders and the apostles that he's raised to be his shepherds on earth over the flock. Now, is this boring, you guys? Honestly, be honest with me, because I'm here to serve you. I don't, I don't want to force my will on you guys, and I want to help you understand. I want you to learn and grow how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible. Is it clear? Okay. We're almost done with these examples, and then we're going to sum it up. And Lord willing, I'm going to have to do a talk on salvation by grace. There's only one judge, James 4.12. James chapter 4, verse 12, there's only one judge, one lawgiver. James chapter 4, verse 12. There's one lawgiver and judge, and it uses the word heis again, the same word used in 1 Timothy 2, 5, heis or is, right? One lawgiver, one judge. Who is that one judge? John 5, tells you. Nor does the father judge anyone, but he has given all judgment to his son. So Jesus, our Lord, is the one judge. He's the one judge, right? Oh, but hold on. Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 19, 28. Jesus said to them, to the 12 apostles, Amen, I say to you that you who have followed me in the new age, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, you yourselves will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. James says there's only one judge, Jesus. And you said the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to you. How can there be other judges if you're the only judge, the one judge? What about 1 Corinthians 6, 2 to 3? Paul speaking to the church. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 to 3. Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 to 3. Do you not know that the holy ones will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Wait, 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 Paul. Wait, wait, Paul. Jesus said all judgments given, given to him. There's only one judge. And yet you're telling me all believers will judge the world, judge angels. And Jesus, you're telling me the 12 apostles will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. But there's one judge. Heis. Same word used in 1 Timothy 2.5. One mediator. There can't be any other. You see? We're almost done. How many fathers are there? One father, Matthew 23, 9. Call no one on earth your father, for you have but one father in heaven, and it's Heis again. God estin himon ha pater. Heis, is, pater. One father. One father, right? 
Hold on. Romans 4.17. Romans 4.17. For this reason, it depends on faith. Romans 4.17. So that may be a gift and the promise may be guaranteed to all his descendants, not to those who only adhere to the law, but to those who follow the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of, all of us. Whoa. Paul, what are you doing? Don't you know Heis Hapater? One father who's in heaven? How can Abraham be the father of us all if only God is our father? Oh, but man, it gets even worse. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 and 15. Okay. I'm writing you this not to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children, even if you should have countless guide, guides to Christ, Yet you do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Wait, Paul. You can't be the father of anyone. We only have one father in heaven. How can you say you became their father and Abraham's the father of us all? Habib, Ibrahim, you want me to get blocked? Keep talking and change the subject. Are you guys now seeing a pattern here? No, legend, you're not. You don't come here and correct me because of the King James, which I love and cherish, when the word in the Greek that the King James uses is shepherd. Do it again, I'll block you. Okay? The Greek word feed in the King James is the word shepherd. Okay, that's okay, legend. That's not what you said. You go, you're being honest, and it doesn't say this. That's more of a challenge. Please don't challenge me. Learn from me, benefit from me, reject what you think is wrong, but don't challenge me. I'm not here to debate you. But you guys see the pattern, right? You see the pattern that you can no longer say because the verse uses the word one or it uses the word only or it says no one. Automatically, that means everyone else is excluded. That's not how the Bible works. That's not how the Bible uses such restrictive language. You with me there? Is it making sense now? If I made my point, here's the article. Okay. So to sum up, just because 1 Timothy 2.5 says Jesus is the one mediator, that in of itself does not prove there are no other mediators who share in Jesus's work of mediation in union with him. In point of fact, Paul is teaching the opposite point. What he's saying in context is not that because Jesus is the one mediator, there is no one else. No, he's teaching the opposite. He's saying you believers, because you're born of the spirit, united to Christ. You are his spiritual body, the household of God. You now have the boldness and confidence to go before God, supplicate God, intercede with God for the salvation of others, and know your intercession will be accepted by God because you have that one mediator who makes you acceptable to God. So in the world, we use verse 52, 5 to try to attack the doctrine of communion saints when that passage is also misused by anti-Trinitarians to refute that Jesus is God because that same verse says the one God is distinct from Christ because Christ is the one mediator before that one God. So if Jesus being the one mediator means no other mediators, the one God who's distinct from Christ would prove that Jesus can't be God. Hogwash. We know Jesus is God and we know others do mediate and share in his intercession. Hogwash, we know Jesus is God in union with one God, and we know others share in Jesus' work of mediation. Clear? First last, are you Greek? So if that's clear, I want to talk about this doctrine that says, and I'll do a part two on it, the requirement to be someone who mediates and intercedes for believers, George Wagner, is to be born of the Spirit of Christ, united to Christ, one with Christ in the Spirit, 
by faith in him, trusting in him, loving him. You have to be a member of the body of Christ for your intercession and prayers to be acceptable to God. God bless you, Selwyn. Is that clear? Now, with that said, let me see. Any questions before I move to the second part? Or I may just have to stop it here because we got to get ready for the debate. In about 42 minutes, Anthony Rogers will be debating a Unitarian heretic on David Wood's Acts 17 Apologetics channel. So we want to catch it. Gulid Ilias, the Roman Catholics tell me the same thing. Coptics tell me the same thing. The Nestorian churches tell me the same thing. Let's not get there unless you want to be blocked. You need to come back home to the Roman Catholic Church, you apostate. See how easy it is to speak stupidly? Okay. Okay. If that's clear, no questions. If that's clear, no questions. Yeah, I think that's what it is, Basira, because they're trying to convert it into U.S. currency. Gulad, the original church is the Coptic church, and you, as an Orthodox, are a heretic. You're wicked, you're evil, you're going to hell. You see how easy it is to do that? And by the way, for those of you who are Orthodox, I'm just attacking one of your own who's trying to cause division by saying the Orthodox church is the true church, right? And we need to return to it. So I'm going to send you back to the Orthodox church. Here you go. Here you go, my friend. Enjoy life in your little room, in the corner of your room. All right. What's the question, Medic? Repeat, because we got distracted by this agent of Satan who instead of trying to focus on what unites us and focus on the topic at hand, wants to attack all Christians, send them all to hell because the Orthodox Church is a true church. Okay, what's the question? I'm going to do, Pablo, I'm going to do another session on this message by these particular dispensationalists who claim that the apostles until Paul preached a different gospel because the mystery of redemption by faith in the blood of Christ was only revealed to Paul, the apostle. I don't see the question, folks, but I'll address part of it right now. I'll address part of it right now. Yes, exactly, medic for Christ. is saying that Jesus is the one mediator who makes our petitions acceptable to God and gives us bold access to God so we have nothing to fear. Exactly, medic for Christ. Yes, and Habib, the Catholics tell me they're the original church of the disciples. The Coptics tell me they're the original church of the disciples. All you... Clowns tell me the same thing. And I'm not disrespecting Orthodox Christians or Coptic. I'm disrespecting you clowns. If I debate you, I'll decimate you and humiliate you because you're an agent of Satan. Do not claim you're an Orthodox Christian because you are not this agent of Satan like you, you clown. Set up a debate and I'll decimate you, you wicked agent of Satan. Don't you like it? I'm an equal opportunity offender. I offend every major branch of Christianity. Don't you love it about me? I offend fellow Protestants, evangelicals, even friends. So you can't say I'm inconsistent. I am consistently offending everyone. Come on, guys. You don't get more for, uh, more consistent than that, right? Now, for the record, I'm not attacking the Orthodox Church or the Coptic Church or the Roman Catholic Church or the Church of the East. I'm attacking these wicked slime, these agents of Satan, who think that they are doing their church a service by coming and attacking other Christians, causing schisms like children of the devil. Okay? It's for the record here. Is that clear? Okay, now, real quickly, because we got a few more minutes, real quickly, there's a particular group of dispensationalists that say, up until Paul's conversion, okay, up until... Paul's conversion. Listen to this. 
listen to this view because I'm going to do an in-depth refutation of it, God willing, tomorrow night. You guys want me to come on tomorrow night? How many of you guys want me to do a live stream tomorrow night? It's going to be late night, though. It's going to be like 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You guys okay if I come in 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? How many ones? Okay. Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to do that. So, Pablo, I'm going to do a thorough refutation of this movement tomorrow. But let me give you a foretaste tonight, right now, because we're going to shut down in about 10 minutes. Eugenio Carmo, you said two, all right, but the majority wins, so you're ousted. <laughs> la, 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 la. Reduso, why two, Reduso? And Edward Arnato, you are a credit to your church, the Greek Orthodox Church, because you don't come here and attack us as schismatics who are heretics or going to hell. Right? Thank you, brother. You bring respect to your church instead of causing people to look down upon your church by attacking people. Look, we're jerks in every major branch of Christianity. You have jerks in Protestantism. Idiota, Idiota is one of them, even though I still love them. Jerks in Catholicism, jerks in the Assyrian, jerks everywhere, and I'm one of them. But I'm a lovable jerk, and I'm a handsome jerk. Don't hate. All right. Anyway, there is a branch. There is a branch, a branch of dispensationalists. Now, go do a Google search on what dispensationalism teaches. I don't have time to unpack it. Let's say, guys, pay attention to this. Let's say this. And I'm going to refute it real briefly for, for the benefit of our brother Pablo. Pablo, this is for you too. So listen. They say, up until the conversion of the Apostle Paul, MMA, but I love boxing because to be a great MMA fighter, you need to know how to box. Up until the time of the Apostle Paul, watch here. The apostles preached that salvation came by repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus. They did not know the doctrine of redemption through faith in the blood of Jesus. Are you with me there? They did not know... The doctrine, they did not know the doctrine through faith in the blood of Jesus. That was revealed to Paul. That was a mystery revealed to Paul. That's what they teach. Are you now ready for, for me to refute that in 10 minutes? And by the grace of God, tomorrow, I'm going to go through this doctrine and thoroughly refute it by the grace of the triune God. Let me show you that the doctrine that you're saved by the grace of Jesus through faith in his blood, was already taught by Jesus himself to the apostles long before Paul. Are you ready? Are you ready for me to teach it and show you it? Let me show you that this doctrine, that you're saved by the grace of Jesus through faith in him on the basis of his shed blood, that he lived the perfect life for us and shed his blood to pay our debt of sin, that doctrine was already taught by Jesus to his apostles while he was on earth before the apostle Paul. Okay. Let's go to Galatians 3 verse 2, Galatians 3 verse 5, and Galatians 3 14. Galatians chapter 3 verse 2, Galatians chapter 3 verse 5, Galatians chapter 3 verse 14. Let's see what Paul says about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? Galatians chapter 3 verse 2. Read with me, folks. Read. This only what I learn of you. Receive thee the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So Paul's saying, how do you receive the Spirit? Not by the works of law. You received it by hearing the gospel and believing. You received the Spirit of God. Galatians 3, 5. Read. Galatians 3, 5. Hold on. In Jesus' name. By the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. Hold on. All right. Then. Yeah. Okay. Galatians 3, 5. Galatians 3, 5, by the blood of Jesus, Satan, we rebuke you by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, damn you to hell. The blood of Christ be our covering. The enemy was upset. Galatians 3, 5, he therefore that ministered to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of law or by the hearing of faith? You see what Paul is saying? The miracles we do and the spirit you receive came by hearing the gospel and believing. Galatians 3.14, Galatians 3.14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Through faith, right? I receive the Spirit of life through faith in Jesus Christ, right? I receive the Holy Spirit 
through faith in Jesus Christ, correct? Did Jesus teach that? John 7, 38 to 39. Jesus not only taught that to the apostles, he taught it to the unbelievers. John 7, 38 to 39. 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. Watch here. Jesus speaking to unbelievers with the apostles present. He that believeth on me, notice, believe on me, not get baptized. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So you believe you're going to have rivers of living water flowing out of your belly. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. What? Jesus taught the same thing Paul taught. Believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be given the Holy Spirit that will give you everlasting life. And how do you receive the Spirit? By believing in Jesus. Sure sounds like what Paul taught. Edward, I praise you for being a credit to the Orthodox Church, but it turns out that you're another ignoramus being used of the devil. Who's mocking your church when it was two members of your church that attacked us for belonging to false churches saying the Orthodox is the only true church? You wicked, slandering liar. Shame on you. I just got done praising you, you wicked, lying, slandering agent of Satan. Sorry, folks. I'm not here to tickle ears. Say something stupid and slander, then I'm going to block you. Okay. But anyway, did Jesus confirm to the apostles and the disciples, you receive the Holy Spirit by faith in him, believing in him? Love life. Love life. You better get a love life or I'm about to start chewing you out. Okay, did Jesus make it clear long before Paul to the apostles and unbelievers, you receive the Holy Spirit by believing in him, Pablo? Love, love, you're a fellow Chaldean, don't let me lay hands on you. You know what, because then you're going to ask pa uh, Padre Pio to help you, and then we're going to be in trouble. Okay. Don't think I don't know who you are. I know where you live, son. Okay, so Pablo, you see that. So where in the world do these Christians get the doctrine that salvation by grace through faith in the blood of Christ is something only revealed to Paul? I'm almost done. Two more minutes. Final one for tonight. Final one for tonight. And God willing, tomorrow, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lord willing, I'm going to go in-depth in refuting this doctrine if you guys still want me to do it and invite people and pray for the internet connectivity. Final one, Pablo. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. So should I not delete this video but leave it? My lives. Okay. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Okay, I'll leave it on. All right. Read with me, Pablo, everyone else. Long before Paul, long before Paul, to the apostles, even Judas there, Matthew 26, 26 to 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Post 28 one more time. Matthew 26, 28. Post 28 one more time. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, Pablo, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So, Pablo, did you see it? Jesus said to the apostles long before Paul, I'm going to shed my blood to forgive sins. So where in the world did they get this notion that redemption through faith in the blood of Jesus was something revealed to Paul, wasn't known before that? 
God willing, tomorrow I'm going to do a full exposition refuting this doctrine. Lord willing, tomorrow, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I hope you're blessed, right? I hope you're challenged. I hope you learn how to interpret the Bible and how not to interpret the Bible. Pray for me to be holy, pure, bold as a lion, right? Slaying dragons by the blood of Jesus, willing to die for Jesus, but also pray I'm filled with love, compassion, and patience. To have that balance, right? For the glory of Jesus. Pray that God will cover my daughters by his blood. Pray 60 days. God deliver me miraculously from a corrupt, wicked judge and provide for my needs and keep me going for his glory until I die. And never shame Jesus, never blaspheme Jesus. God forbid, may the Spirit seal us and preserve us for the glory of Christ. And pray that the Lord will bring that godly woman sooner than later. If he's pleased, his will be done. I have someone in mind. He knows it is. Ask the Lord to show me if she's not the one for his glory. See you tomorrow, God willing, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Head over to Acts 17 Apologetics. Watch the debate as Anthony Rogers decimates and slaughters another tool of Satan for the glory of the triune God. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, preserve us by your spirit. Wash us in your blood. Keep us in love with you and save us from the enemy. We love you, Jesus. Were you guys blessed today or are you upset? If you're blessed, put a one. If I upset you, put a two. All right. All right. Love you guys. See you on... David's channel.